I'm here with Liz Lockhead. Um, we have just opened between the Fix Bubble and the, the Speech Balloon, balloon. <laughs> uh, on Monday. Uh, this is a well deserved last wine. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> between the Fix Bubble and the Speech Balloon, it's a slightly different format to a normal like, yeah. play. place. So. Yes, because it's not really a play, quite, although it kind of is. Um, it's, a, it's a portmanteau. Piece. Uh, one of the the actors said that you know these things that have got an overarching story. It's a very simple story. Mm -hmm. It's a, a guy who uh, is on a creative writing course and he doesn't think he can do it. And then is he deciding can he do it or not? Not a very exciting story. Um, but that just sort of ties together some wonderful monologue yeah. um, written by people who I thoroughly admire. And that was the impetus behind it. Um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Billy Letford, William Letford, who's mm -hmm. currently in India, so he won't see this one. Um, I saw him do a wonderful monologue called Thomas. He called it a story it's in the voice of this guy, this you know, strange guy at a bus stop, a strange, wonderful, innocent, an innocent. Yeah, not a daft exactly, but a complete innocent yeah. at a bus stop. I love that voice. Another friend of mine, Grace Cleary, who's um, also new to the Oran Moore stage, and mm -hmm. actually to the stage at all, is uh, called Grace Cleary and she's um, she's at least my age. She might I think Grace might be a year older than me even. But anyway, Tom Leonard and I met her in a, a writing um, workshop we were doing years mm. ago and it was a poetry workshop but she um, came out during the week that we were all away together that she writes monologues and I saw that this one um, which was then called uh, at home at Rose Cottage or something, which is the one that Gabriel Quigley does, which is a, a care home person. Um, and Grace is a very good writer, although she's never earned her living by writing. She's been writing wonderful, astute, sharp monologues for years. And uh, she actually was one of the Travers 50 emerging writers last year, although she's, you know, at least my age. Uh, there's another one, a friend of mine, Henry Bell, who's who I met when he was a student at Glasgow University when I was writer in residence. Mm -hmm. I love Henry's writing um, and he loves Oren Moore. We often meet each other at Oren Moore, you know, he'll maybe yeah. phone me up and I'm working away and he'll say, do you want to Oren Moore today? And uh, we try, I mean, I try and not miss a single Oren Moore. Uh, and I've loved Oren Moore because of the amount of new emerging writers that I've seen doing things here. I mean, I was blown away when I saw the first David Ireland play here. I was blown away when I, I saw um, Gary McNair's play running, you know, and there's people that I don't know already that I love, but um, I had these lovely bits of writing and I said to David, I'd love to do a show, but it's just people at a bus stop, and at a bus stop, we don't know what's going on inside the heads of the people around us, and if you could just, take a wee, you know, wave a wee magic wand and let them speak out what's driving them. And then I had the problem, and it was a terrifying problem, of making it into a single show, which I think we have yeah. via the team. Yeah. yeah, it really mm -hmm. works as a as an a overall single, a single piece. It doesn't feel like a good, piece because, because that was our struggle. Yeah, obviously. that was because there's so many like bits of writing in different voices, but I, uh -huh. it's tied together really beautifully. I think it does have that art, like that sad oh, story. Oh, yeah, it's a, a gentle art. You yeah, know. it's not. You know, it's not somebody, you know, getting out of space or whatever, but it's a gentle story and I, I wrote it for specific people, you know, just when I was starting to write Mark, the overarching thing, mm -hmm. I thought, whose this voice is this? And I thought, this is Sandy, you yeah. know. So we've got a good, we've got slightly uh, more than our normal yes, uh, exactly. Pike Pike team. We've got a great team, we've got Sandy uh, Nelson. Sandy Nelson, and I thought, Sandy Nelson is the overriding person. Mm -hmm. We've got Gabriel Quigley, yeah. who I've known for years and loved her work. I've never actually worked on a professional bit of uh, theatre with yeah, Gabriel. We've uh, been friends for years um, and admirers of each mm -hmm. other, I think, but no, um, uh, we've never worked together. I mean, she's just fantastic. It, um, playing somebody much older than herself. That's the thing, I didn't cast the actors particularly um, as those characters, but you know, I it was, was, it was yeah. tight, it was, it was about, because they play other voices in the thing as well, but they've all got a main character that they play. The different people that are in it, there's Mark and there's Molly, uh, and I wrote Molly, this character, who's got two monologues, one short, one at the bus stop, and one later that finishes the show. Well, if you're going to be the boss, you'll give yourself a talk, Melon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's been, it's been lovely fun. Yeah. And uh, I was, two weeks ago today, Susie, I was in a state of complete abject terror because I knew I had um, a wonderful Tom Leonard material that 
ties it together in ways that are kind of to do with your dream, your inside dream. But this person that Mark, that Sandy plays, is a Tom Leonard, uh, you know, kind of wow aficionado. He's just found the book and he thinks this is changing his life, as it changed the lives of me and many people who have heard it. So yeah. there's a lot of me in Sandy, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and then there's a lot, and Sandy is a writer himself, and that's why I wanted Sandy to play the part, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it just was great. And I, I, all I knew about Harry Ward, I'd seen him once again in Orrin Moore, mm -hmm. and I thought, he's a fantastic actor. And I didn't know him at all as a person, I didn't know what a wonderful company member he, he is, is he as is, well. Yeah, he's worked with Harry a lot, he is a good, right. really good company member, yeah. I, th I yeah. thought he'd be a good guy, yeah. but I didn't know, yeah. and he didn't know me, and it was that's the thing, it's the amount of trust that they put in it, because the script that they started off with, their individual monologues, they could tell there was jewels in it, but there was too much wonderful yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. We had to find a way of making a, a, sh a gentle shape to allow these jewels to come out. It's a bit like... I've got some wonderful gemstones in these monologues and I had to find just a simple filigree setting yeah, for that's them. Nice that's way. the way yeah. I thought about it. And then um, you know, it's it's been like Gabe and um Gabriel and, and the uh, Kirsten and I like, were talking last week and they were saying it is very experimental. And I was saying, yes, but we don't want to say that to the audience because <laughs> I mean, i.e. we've been experimenting. But we don't want to end up with an experimental bit of theatre. Yeah. We want it to be a story. But it also feels, after I saw the runners, like it feels so human. Like it, you do emo really emotionally connect with it. Well, that's, that's good, good because, I mean, there's bits of it that I find, and these are the, these people that I love, their monologues, that I find deeply sad as well as deeply mm, funny. There is, yeah. Uh -huh. As a writer, writing monologues and writing short pieces is, in terms of a, the discipline and the skill, as opposed to approaching like a larger piece of work, like how do you approach it? And do you do you find it easier? Do you find it more difficult? Do you, or is it just a different? It's different. It's just different. But for me, it's being honest, mm -hmm. it's me celebrating how I came into writing right. for the theatre. Um, Marcella Evaristi, who was on last week mm -hmm. with her play, she said to me in 1970. Seven or seventy-eight. Let's do a poetry reading where we learn the words off by heart. And so I said, yes, that'd be great, you know. And then I found out that I couldn't. I mean, I was already quite an experienced reader of my own poetry. Yeah. I found out that to learn the poem off by heart and just say it, it didn't feel right to the audience. So I started. I wrote a whole lot of characters that were speaking monologues. I'd always loved monologues. I'd always loved, you know, Joyce Grenfell and George. Don't do that, you know. And all these <laughs> characters and short pinter monologues. Yeah. So out of that I began to write monologues and then review pieces for the theatre and I worked with Marcella, the music teacher at my school who was called Esther. I was still a teacher when I started doing this and so it really got me into writing theatre at all. I think the first thing time I remember meeting David McLennan was after I did a second review called Sugar and Spite. Uh, the first one was called Sugar and Spite, that was Marcella's title. The next one was just True Confessions, and it was Siobhan Redmond and I. And Siobhan had just finished university. She was just about to go to drama school. And she came along and we did this wee show in the bar of the Tron, and we got 60 quid between the two of us <laughs> for um, doing three evening shows in the week and two lunch times. <laughs> but we did well, it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it was in the Tron bar. But David McLean came along and said, this stuff's really lovely, would you like to write some Wildcat? So I remember writing stuff along with Tom Leonard for a bunch of fives. You know, so um, then many of my friends in the theatre came about that. And then at exactly that time, after doing that, I, I began write. I wrote my very first full-length play, which was called Blood and Ice. And uh, it was about Mary Shelley, Byron, uh, Frankenstein and so on, mm -hmm. and uh, of the first version of it, which thank goodness was on down in Birmingham where I didn't know anybody, the Birmingham <laughs> Evening Post said they would rather be the dentist, mm -hmm. and they also said that, that I knew Ms Lockyer, for all her, knows nothing about the construction of the drama. And after I was able to get out of my bed, pull the down, do it my head and get out, I thought, neither I did, but I do now, mm -hmm. and I started again, and um, uh, I'm... Trying. 
I've written the play that I've written the two plays that are going to be on this year. A couple of years ago, I wrote a play about Edwin Morgan. Like this, a very simple play, a wee three-hander, mm -hmm. um, which embedded poetry mm -hmm. as part of the story. So that was a thing for this, and also my um, only hit play, the only one that earned, earned me any money, which is called um, uh, Perfect Days. Uh, it's going to be on at Pilochry this summer, so I'm currently rewriting that. And I'm also writing, would you believe, a monologue for the National Theatre of Scotland. Uh, thank you, Audrey, uh, for giving us this chance. I mean, only here could you say, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I want to do it. I feel very trusted and um, I well, hope it's not let down the trust. We've wanted to do this very just we've been delighted, so thank you so much. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, Susie. Cheers. Thanks for everything.